All right, thank you everybody so much for joining us today for our next webinar and our webinar series, Road to November. Um, <clears throat> this is a part of our series to just educate the public and our membership a lot more about um, all the important topics that are happening with uh, the very important election that is coming up in just one short month. And I'm sure a lot of people have a lot of thoughts, especially after the debate last night, if any of you tuned in. Um, but today we are joined uh, by Tanya and by Melissa, who are gonna speak a little bit about voter mobilization with students. And um, my name is Annie Siegel. I'm the Interim Director of Member Services at NASW New Jersey, and I'm gonna be moderating the webinar. So if you have any questions or any comments, please feel free to type them in the chat box or to, um, if you're on Facebook, uh, write them in the comments and we'll be sure to address any questions or concerns that you may have. Um, but for now, I'm just gonna turn it over to Tanya. Great, thanks, um, Annie. It's really nice to be with all of you today. And um, I would love to um, I would love to hear from some of you in the chat where you're from and tell me a little bit about yourselves, uh, your name, maybe your school, and your uh, superpower. Um, but we're really happy to be here. I am joined by Melissa Kielty. Um, from the University of Connecticut School of Social Work, and we, um, Melissa is an MSW intern um, with the Humphreys Institute this year. So she is going to uh, present to you with me today. So I'm gonna share my screen. We have a lot of content um, and a call to action for all of you to cover and I want to say a couple of things. One, um, I will be sending some links in the chat and I will also um, make sure that we send these slides out to those of you who want them. So if you want them, let us know, <clears throat> excuse me, let me know and I'll, um, I'll include a link or send, me, send us your email address. So um, I see that there are two people in the waiting room so I'm going to admit them. I don't know how do I do that, okay. All right, um, so as I said, um, I am the director for the Nancy Humphreys Institute for Political Social Work, and we work to increase the political participation and power of social workers in the communities they serve. Um, this is an old picture. I took one on Zoom yesterday, but we do two things really because um, you know, our vision is really a, a democracy that works for and responds to all individuals. And, and in that case, an inclusive democracy, who votes matters and, and representation matters. So we have a campaign school that we run um, every year uh, at, the, at UConn and sometimes um, at other schools across the country. And we train social workers and students to run for office and to lead on campaigns. And we, we have a, a particular emphasis on supporting candidates and leaders who've been traditionally excluded from circles of power. So we know that representation matters and we do that through the campaign school. And then also um, we spend a lot of time on participation in an inclusive democracy because voter turnout matters. Elected officials pay attention to communities and individuals that vote. And so when communities vote, they get more attention, more resources. And when they stay home, um, they're really ignored by, by candidates, by elected officials, and by campaigns. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I did want to, well, we're going to talk about the census. I'll, I'll, there's lots to share. And Annie, just a quick question. Are you able to let folks into the waiting room? I just want to make sure I don't miss anybody. Yes, I'll be monitoring the chat box in the waiting room. Okay, okay. Um, I am going to, um, I want to share this video, but I'm a little worried it's not going to come through. And this, I'm going to only play it for two minutes. Can you hear it? As long as it plays, you can hear it. I love the vote. Oh, I think I did that. Okay, uh, that's not working. 
We'll try one more time and otherwise we're gonna just let it go. Okay, minor technical problem. I'm gonna come back to that, uh, that video of rigged in just a second. Um, I really encourage all of you to, um, to watch it. And it, what it is, is it's a movie that really talks about the intentional voter suppression that is built into, um, that is in our democracy right now. And, and when we think about a democracy and participation, we, we can look at barriers to voting and thinking, think about them as both intentional and um, implicit, because there are many ways that our democracy excludes people because of the way that it was designed. And we have to go back to the beginning and say that, and acknowledge that white supremacy um, and exclusionary tactics were built into it and they persist today. There is this feeling that it, with the Voting Rights Act that all, that all people have the equal access to voting and we know that's not true and we'll spend a little more time on that. I, um, I would like to try one other way to do it, but I think I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna skip. I, I, I'll send it to you, oh, now I just can't even get out of it, let's see. So I would encourage all of you to, to watch it. And, and again, let me just preface the fact that what Rigged is talking about are really the intentional voter suppression tactics to win elections. And when we look at other voter suppression tactics, oftentimes they're about power. But the system is also um, very highly administrative and it is also very hyper-local. So your experience um, voting in one community is very different than voting in another community. So, and, and when we look at this moment in time, we have to acknowledge that this pandemic has magnified these barriers to voting. So we are having all over the country communities that are forced to choose between their right to vote and their health. And in some states, this has been made very, very difficult. I understand that in New Jersey, all of you received a ballot, an absentee ballot. So you can actually vote by mail. And Lana, I'm looking at you because <laughs> if I say anything wrong or if, if, if there's anything um, that you think, uh, it's different in all 50 states. So it's not, it's not possible to know how um, every state is handling it. But we do know that there are some states that are making it really difficult to vote by absentee ballot at, where you even have to have an affidavit of that it's, it's your signature or you have to have a notary or you have to have a witness that it's your signature. And so think about all these layers that are built into this process of voting. And I wanna start with this problem because there are more people that stayed home in 2016 than voted for either Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. So, and that's a presidential election in which more people vote in a, in a presidential election than any other election because its turnout for state and local elections is far lower. So, and, and what we know about non-voters is they tend to be, have less education. They tend to be lower income. They, they often are, are um, individuals of color and unmarried. Now, I am, I'm always really reluctant to generalize because there are populations within the group, within these, these categories of people who vote. But that is overall when we look at that group. And, and they're more likely non-voters, and this was particularly star, um, striking in this, in this study that the Knight Foundation did, non-voters are mo much more likely to think that the system is rigged. So to have a belief that the system um, does not work for them, and they're also passive consumers of news. So again, um, more likely to get their news through perhaps social media channels rather than, um, than other trusted sources. So, and what we, what we believe and what we know is that these, these engagement barriers, so when it's difficult to vote, these systemic barriers create these engagement barriers. So 40, more than 40% of people don't vote because they don't like politics, they, don't, they think the system's rigged, their vote doesn't matter, all those things that, that people respond to, um, that is a, a big reason why people stay home. And that, again, goes up with state and local elections, which are far more important 
thought I changed the slide, but that's okay. I, this is a great example. I don't have the numbers for New Jersey. I do have some New Jersey um, numbers on the next slide, but you can see this was in Detroit um, in last year's mayoral election. 21% of the people turned out to vote for their mayor. 21%, and this is not uncommon. The average is 25% across the country. So, and, and again, when you look at, at communities with higher rates of income, they vote in higher numbers. And so it can be much lower. And what happens with a small number of voting, particularly in our cities, um, is it creates this sort of toxic power it can create concentrated power that can turn into to toxic power because you know that's a lot of control for those voters if we think about where resources go and where attention goes that's 20 percent of the people in detroit getting a say um, or getting more say and more resources and if you map out i i encourage all of you if you're um if you're in new jersey take a city like um newark or any other city and look at the voter turnout for the municipal election and then drive around that city or think about, does that tell a story of power in this particular city? In Philadelphia, it does in the city where I have practiced most of my career in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, it, it absolutely tells a story of power. There are two sections of the city that vote in higher numbers and the they have, it's a city that has, um, doesn't have enough money to buy textbooks or pay for paper. And yet there's brand new lights in one of the sections, you know, brand new gas lights along the coast. And so, you know, again, you, you look at priorities and the way that um, cities spend their money. And, and you can also, the other thing I would encourage all of you to do, is not just look at your turnout for your community, but to look and see who's who, who's in the, the, your local town committees or your local election committees that are determining the candidates? You know, who's in that, who's in that room? Because it's small. So I encourage all of you to think about um, more broadly when you think about voting. I had this from a presentation I did. Um, it was with um, the Andrew Goodman Foundation and they pulled up this, this report that's really available for every campus. And I would love to know, as I say, when I look at the chat, I'd love to see where you're all from. But um, the, this is from Rutgers. So what we've seen, which is exciting, is that 30%, there was a 30% increase from 2014, the midterms in 2014, versus the midterms in 2018. But that's still only 42% of the students at Rutgers turned out in the 2018 election. That voting block, 18 to 24, is the largest voting block. And you have a lot of influence in that voting block, so we'll, we'll get to that. And when we think about why students don't vote, again, it really is a, an engagement barrier, and sometimes it's a process barrier. And I know Melissa will speak a little bit about um, this experience, but one of the things we know from 2018 is that, and 2019, is that students who were voting by absentee ballot often didn't so because they didn't have a stamp. So again, this process of voting while you're a student, it's confusing and students don't often know that they can register and vote where they're living on campus or that they can vote by absentee ballot by home. But the absentee ballot process, as you all know, is complicated and it requires a lot of transit time in the U.S. mail and any given point it can get held up and um, I am guilty of it myself even just getting a letter out the door with a with a stamp so it, it, I, I'm worried about the absentee ballot process although again I know in New Jersey most of you got ballots I'd love to hear from you in the chat and when we end up at the when we discuss at the end whether or not the students got ballots and how that's working on campuses, because I'm not clear about that. Um, we spoke a little bit about these structural barriers and that they feed this manufactured apathy and this intentional myth that your vote doesn't matter because people in power have always known that voting matters. It is, as the great John Lewis said, it is our most powerful nonviolent tool um, for social justice, racial justice, economic justice, 
voting is central. But when we think about, um, yesterday I presented with the most amazing um, woman named Barbara Arnwine, and I will, I'm gonna send you the link to her organization. She's just phenomenal. But she said, she mentioned there were 61 barriers. So I, I haven't confirmed 61, but let, let, let me say, the voting is different again in all 50 states. The rules around the deadlines are different in 50 states. The rules around who can vote in a primary is different in all 50 states. Who can vote with a felony is determined state by state. In 48 states, if you are incarcerated because of a felony conviction, you cannot vote while you're incarcerated. In two states, you can. In, in um, Vermont and Maine, and no one loses the right to, to vote. And in all those, the rest of those 48 states, it's different. It's a different process. Some you can get the right back after parole, after incarceration, some after parole, some after probation. Some never want to grant it back to you, make it very, very difficult, require you to get a pardon, all kinds of barriers. And with um, 20 million people in our country have a felony conviction, it's really important that students and social workers know the rules in your state. And, and in a little bit, I'm gonna send you a flyer from a local organization that explains, because it's a big deal that New Jersey now allows folks who are on parole to vote. But I will put in a plug and I will also send a commentary that we just had printed over the weekend in the Journal of Social Work that um, we call and stand against all forms of felony disenfranchisement because they were um, racist in their intent and they had continued to be racist in their impact. And that's because of the way that the criminal justice system is, has um, disproportionately affects and punishes communities of color. So that's a long conversation, happy to have more about that. But look at these other suppression tactics, voter ID, purging voting, voter, um, voter lists, challenging student registrations, reducing poll locations. What we know from the data, and this one report that I show here from the, um, from the Brennan Center for Justice, is that communities that have higher um, populations of African Americans and or Latinx um, individuals, they wait longer in longer lines. So again, this experience of voting is very different from community to community. And Georgia right now is sort of ground zero for looking at what that, or for shining a bright light on the disparities in voting, but you can find it all across the country. Um, I'd like to mention to all of you, um, our work centers around voting as an intervention. Um, because voting is a social determinant of health. The act of voting is good for individuals and it's good for communities. Communities that vote in higher rates have higher, um, higher um, rates of health and mental health and education and earnings and schools and um, more resources. There is a significant amount of research that shows that communities and states and um, cities that vote in higher rates get more attention and more resources. And that's true on every level. Individuals that vote also, there is some research showing that it's actually good for the individual. There are some, um, there is some evidence in the journals that voting offsets some forms of, of oppression and, dis and feelings of oppression and discrimination. Voting in young people has been shown to correlate with higher rates of income and earning. Uh, earning, future earnings. So this act of voting is an act of power and it really is central to empowerment practice. So for a long time, I've heard social workers say, politics doesn't, isn't relevant to my practice and I don't want to include it. Well, I'm here to say it is relevant and we know it's relevant and it is part of, it, it is a strategy and important tool for addressing the systemic barriers that affect the clients that we serve. It is a human right, it is complicated to do, and social workers are great at this. <clears throat> so when we think about all of you who are going to practice on the micro, meso, and macro level, you know, on the micro level, and you're, whether it's in an organizational context or whether you are an individual practitioner, you're, you should find ways 
to ask people whether they're registered, if they need information about how to vote, when to vote, where to vote. Um, if they know what, how to find information on candidates, this is particularly true in down ballot races. We're talking about a very um, visible presidential election. We are in the urgency of now as all of us who think about voting. But this is long-term work because really those local and state officials have a tremendous amount of control and over the lives and the well-being of um, our communities and our clients. So again, this is, this is long-term work, and it's often much more difficult to get information on the local level. At the meso level, we have to change this narrative that your vote doesn't matter because when you stay home, you, the power of your community goes down. And so we want people to see voting as a collective behavior, as, as stronger together. And then the macro level, really integrating into our practice advocacy for expanded voting rights and access making sure that we are paying attention on the local level, we are paying attention on the national level to make sure that every vote is counted. And we can do that by being poll involved in our town committees, we can be poll monitors. There's lots of ways we can also support um, our democracy. And I mentioned to you that, that there has been a lot of resistance in the last you know, six years since I've been at the Humphreys Institute. There's been a lot of resistance to this work by um, micro practitioners, but more and more are standing up to say and reading the code of ethics and seeing that it actually is in our code of ethics to be doing this, but it is hard work. And frankly, organizations and social workers are worried about being partisan. They're worried about being accused of being partisan. So we have resources for you because this is all about how to vote and giving people information they need to be informed voters. But it is not about telling them who to vote for. It's not about endorsing a party. It's not about um, you know, leaning them in one direction or making comments. We can't do that as, a, as social workers. We have to stay nonpartisan. But we also recognize that there are organizations that really feel like you know what, I've got, we've got more than we can do. We're underpaid um, and we're asked to do too much. And I can understand that. But I think most of us should also be looking to philanthropy and looking to funders to say, um, this really relates to our mission. This is central to our mission. And, and there, is, there is more recognition about that. The community foundations are doing a much better job about engaging and seeing the role that voter turnout in this moment and in this election the, the one silver lining is people are talking about voting. So if you are in an agency, I think you may see more of that. Um, I'll send you on our website is this great report that came out of NASW. Um, it's Mental Health Committee written by Cheryl Aguilar, talking about how this works in clinical practice and, and how, to, how to frame this in clinical practice. I encourage you to read it, it's excellent. Um, I mentioned this earlier, we have a lot of information on our website about how to stay nonpartisan. And what we hear a lot of times is that organizations, organizations don't feel comfortable with the, non, with the nonpartisan rules. So for you to be able to bring them to your field supervisor or to your organization will be very helpful because in some cases, your organization may be in non-compliance with the law. The 1993 Voter Registration Act, the Motor Voter Law, um, which allows us to register to vote at, um, at our motor, vote, motor vehicle departments, also requires that any organization that is signing people up for federal benefits, like um, SNAP or Medicaid or um, um, TANF Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, that they have to be offering people the opportunity to register to vote. And that includes our state agencies that do that as well. So um, we've got lots of resources. We've also have a resource for you as students. You're all probably working on your educational contracts right now. These are great activities for you to include in your educational contract to get practice. What we know about pol political action is it's not just the training, but it's the doing. And that's the unique, um, the, you know, that's the unique part about our education as social workers, that we take what we learn in the classroom and we apply it in our field agencies. And so for all of you to take this opportunity to apply these concepts in your field, I hope you'll use it. It ties to all nine 
of our um, core competencies. And we have this worksheet, again, on our website so that if you want to include some of these, it'll also give you, if you're in, you know, if you're focusing on a more micro track, it'll give you, you can expand your um, experience to bring in some macro into your uh, social work practice. I don't know if I'm going to try the video again, but let me see. And then I'm going to turn it over to Melissa. <laughs> nope. <laughs> we'll send you these links. Um, this is a great uh, video that was done by young people and it was a winner in the um, Civic Life Project. So I, I may see if towards the end, if I, while well, Melissa is speaking, if I can uh, send some links to some of these things. But um, otherwise, I am going to turn it over to Melissa and I'm gonna start monitoring the chat. And Melissa, I will keep my screen up and you can just let me know when to, when to move. You got it. So I'm happy to have everyone here today and I'm hoping that everyone is doing all right. I'm, an MSW student myself here at the Institute and this slide and the next couple of slides I really want to focus on a few main points who do we talk to how do we talk to them and so how do we frame our conversations based on the issues that we're concerned about so this slide that you're looking at right now shows you the three levels of government that are well known even though I, I believe Tanya told me before this uh, presentation started that New Jersey has county level governments uh, Connecticut does not, but it's all the same local base. So I tend to look at a chart like this as really an easy way to break down how I'm going to focus my advocacy conversation and skills, whether that's with my community, my clients, or my institutions, or whomever I'm trying to speak with on, on behalf of larger issues that impact other people. So when, like, let's say you're concerned about a new national policy and we're looking at how how do we engage with our issues at hand and how do we break down who to reach out to uh, I think that's been a huge barrier and this is just my experience as a student uh, when it comes to getting other social worker students and, and perhaps the micro clinical focus more so the macro how do we get students to realize the relevancy of this information on behalf of clients everyday experiences so I really want to harp on making sure that we can we as social workers understand who and how to engage um, depending on the issues that we're looking at so let's say you're concerned about the public health outcomes of children in a given area in your state who what kind of state agencies or what kind of local agencies have uh, that power over that certain catchment area I think a lot of what this slide is showing us is as social workers especially as students learning how to shape our language to reflect the relevancy of the bodies that uh, bodies of authority that we're trying to um, convince or so to speak to advocate on behalf of you can go to the next slide whenever you're ready. So this slide is really helpful for compartmentalizing most of the information I just spoke of. So I like to do this on my own time as well, especially as a student and especially given a major election season right now is making sure that we can create a chart or an easy to read graphic that can not only help us understand who our representatives are but also their contact information their phone numbers and especially their term lengths and making sure that we're keeping track of elections because there's different election cycles depending on uh, local to national government and that can be really overwhelming for people or clients who really want to get involved or they don't know how uh, their involvement can be relevant. There's a lot of information out there and um, let me move this chat box so I can see it a little bit better. Oh, so this one sheet, Know Your Elected Officials, is on the, our website. So we're going to be able to send that to you and it really helps kind of break down certain questions and directions. Like, for example, if I'm looking at an issue regarding water quality in my town or how can I get my water quality tested or a client who's having a certain health problem, how can I help them to dissect who and who to talk to in terms of uh, healing their issues? Well, this 
it's funny to think that at first we might not think that our elected officials could help us solve these uh, micro experiences of our clients. However, we can look at our sheet and determine, well, who's the authority at hand that we can advocate on at a macro level while we're working at a micro level. So Tanya, you can go to the next slide whenever you're ready. So this is another video that uh, a student testified on behalf of, a UConn student testified on behalf of uh, the Labor Committee. However, due to our other technical problems, we'll give it a try, <laughs> but I'm not sure if it'll work. work. I don't think it's gonna work, but let's, let's see. <clears throat> Good evening, Sheree. Hi, good evening. Representative Carter, Senator Gohm, Senator Minor, and the esteemed members of the Labor Committee. My name is Sheree Truman, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Connecticut School of Social Work. I'm a longtime resident of Hartford, and I stand in support of HB 5386, an act concerning various pay equity and fairness measures. I'm a first generation college graduate, an immigrant, and a young black woman. Soon I will be graduating with my master's degree in social work. Despite so, I am anxious about the job market and ability to receive equal pay. I share the same concerns as many other young female professionals, especially women of color. This is my reality and reality of other black female professionals facing the workforce. The wage gap exists across every education level for black women. Black women are, especially, are typically paid less than white non-Hispanic men in the same occupation. And in Connecticut, women of color earn significantly less than their male counterparts. She's amazing. I'll just say before we we, did, we know we don't have time to watch the whole thing, but um, all, all of our macro students have to testify, she? and so um, we wanted to show you that because practice makes it easier, right, Melissa? You've done it. Yeah, and and I'm really happy to to see that at least that video worked a little bit. Um, Testifying is certainly quite the experience, and you can always submit testimony online. I believe you can do that anywhere, but as I know Connecticut, I'm just speaking on behalf of where I live. So, so this slide really covers how to get out the vote and get out the census action. I'm sure all of you are in the same boat as me and just totally overwhelmed with the abrupt systemic changes in regards to when the census completes. And it was supposed to end today, and then it didn't and it got extended to six days from now, right at the last minute, it seems like that was overnight. So when it comes to the census, I just wanna talk briefly about why completion of the census is important. For one, it helps allocate resources to reflect the needs of a population. It helps measure who lives where, how many people live where, and eventually how much aid, like federal financial aid going to things such as social programs that directly impact marginalized groups. I believe in Hartford, Connecticut, the statistic is as low as only 50% of residents have completed this, the, um, the census, if I'm correct, Tanya. So that is really bad news, and, and it's concerning. It's a huge public health issue, it's a social welfare issue, and it's a human rights issue. Um, I want to also kind of just touch upon why engaging with census work, get out the vote work is a social work duty. I believe that it's also a macro intervention to have social workers engaging clients to complete uh, the census, not only for allocating funds to help uh, improve the daily life of marginalized groups, but also preserving and representing uh, how many, like for example, the census determines how many representatives each state has in Congress for the next decade. And if there's not an accurate count, then that's definitely going to not, that's not going to create equitable access to representation on the political spectrum. Um, so that's definitely some a, a way that social workers can utilize their macro and micro experiences to uplift the voices and also just engaging on a systemic level and challenging systemic mistrust over time, changing the culture of how we participate as citizens in this country. So you can look on this, uh, this screen as well and there's phone resources, there's forms you can mail in and there's also a website to complete the census and 
you should definitely talk with your supervisors at your internships and maybe your field education office at your schools to learn how to maybe do this work on your campus if possible or how to do that uh, virtually with other uh, social work students at your school. Registering voters, I'm hoping that most of you have been at least trying to get involved with this uh, because I, I tend to think this is the most important thing we can do right now. There's a lot of long-term work in what, we're, what we've been discussing today. However, there's an extreme short-term urgency to complete uh, getting register, voters registered. So there's other there's different different ways to do it. One of which is you can obviously do, vote by mail. Um, you can go to your town registrar of voters or election council or whatever the name is in, in your town or city and really call them and ask how you can help most of the time especially as, as a young person. I live in a town that's very small with a very aging population. They're always looking for people to help get engaged. And I really appreciate any effort that any one of my other peers and colleagues does in terms of taking care of being a poll worker or anything of the sort. So you can also, there's a QR code here on the screen. You can use your phone. I actually have no idea how to use a QR code but you can use your phone to scan that and what it'll do is it will uh, link you to vote er where you can text vote sw at 3444 and it will help you register to vote or any other persons in your life like immediately um you can go to uh, vote -er .com or vote your -er, vote -er .org and you can look at uh, other means of how you can get people registered to vote just by using a phone yeah, thank you. I see the chat. <laughs> thank you for explaining that in uh, better ways. So, uh, Tanya, I think you can uh, go to the next slide now. So educating and engaging. So I'm going to be really focusing on this slide from the perspective of being a student, uh, particularly a graduate student. So there's like I, like I just mentioned, there's so many different ways we can vote in this election. There's absentee and there's in-person. I say so many, but the process of absentee voting in Connecticut is relatively quite complicated. You have to first get an application for an absentee ballot from the Secretary of State, and then you have to mail that into, I believe, either the Secretary of State in the Capitol or our Registrar of Voters, and then you get your absentee ballot, and that you also have to either drop off at your town register our voters or mail it in for people who have no idea. Also, voting is super important because it's, I try to think of candidates on the ballot themselves, but they represent issues and ideologies that are going to further impact outcome welfare, you name it, and especially economic welfare going forward in a time of really extreme financial strife, to be quite honest with you, especially at the national level. So when you register to vote too, also there's our website can explain this in, in much better fashion than I can right now, but there's rules and guidelines for special populations such as survivors of domestic violence or residents in long-term care and how we can engage uh, those special populations to vote and also make sure that they're maintaining their physical, emotional safety in the process. And social workers have a huge advantage when just due to our training and experiences in helping special populations stay engaged and also just empowering their ability to feel good about being civically engaged. You can go to the next slide. So I think this slide really kind of encourages uh, or describes what I was speaking about earlier. There's so many different election cycles, whether that's your state rep, your first selectman, your town selectman, your council government, that it's hard to really keep track in how to make a voting plan based on the level of government of which that election is occurring in. So it's definitely really easy and helpful to, me, especially in, in the age of social media, how, how, how can you make graphics uh, with your phone, with social media, how can you utilize your online presence to really bring in your networks at, uh, within your friend group or at school and promoting visual spaces uh, spaces online or in your schools. Um, for example, 
I was uh, engaging with a, a nonprofit for undocumented rights at my school to engage people to vote. And we were just in the library just so people can see like, okay, there's a ballot, there's applications and there's young people. Let's talk to them. Let's have, let's normalize the conversation of civic engagement. Uh, that's just one way to do it. And just reminding people to stay involved. Sometimes just your presence or a simple post is something that catches people's eyes. And so I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard of the Brennan Center for Justice. They're a wonderful website for all kinds of social issues and, da and data, um, restoring voting rights and unlock the vote um, in terms of looking at advocacy with felon voting, um, advocacy policy changes and, and just overall just personal experience in the ACLU, of course. So those are just some resources and I really recommend looking on our website. I, I spend probably hours every week just for fun, refreshing information on all of this. Okay, thank you. So social workers have a really unique position and kind of brings back the points I've been talking about. You've heard me say public health all the time, but as we know, public health, social determinants of health and right to digni of dignity to live is all interrelated in terms of how, how do people engage? There's, there's a presence that social workers have, whether it's food pantries, your school, shelters, after school programs, daycare, people you babysit for. Um, there's so many ways that we can touch people's lives just in our training and how we can be accommodating to different uh, circumstances in our lives. So social workers definitely can help people find information as well. Uh, help people talk to their registrar voters. Just today, I had a friend ask me, I'm, I live here, my mailing address is in this certain town, however, I'm not going to be physically present the day of voting and I haven't gotten my absentee ballot, what do I do? So make sure that you can at least get yourself familiarized with your local jurisdiction so that when someone of any circumstance in your life does ask you, you can at least say, well, let's try this together, or I think you can call your town clerk or, or whoever. Social workers definitely have that ability to help people participate. Even if you don't know the right answer, just get familiar with the information and it kind of comes naturally. Okay. <laughs> oh, and I think that's it, <laughs> right? No, okay. So Tani, do you, do you wanna touch on this slide with me as well? Sure. I just wanna um, hopefully, my computer's really giving me a hard time. Can you hear me okay, Melissa? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. It's in a very funny loop on my side. Um, anyway, so this voter turnout matters to the outcomes of our communities because the more mm. people that turn out, the more p and um, turn out on election day, the more candidates we actually get, the more p the higher voter turnout, you actually get more candidates, more accountability, better leaders, better policy, and better outcomes for communities. Mm -hmm. So this is central to social work mission. Our, our mission, our prof professional mandate, and our impact. All right, so I'm gonna do right. a and Oh, go ahead. Um, that's kind of just why I, I tie in public health with, with voting and social work all the time because we're always talking about voting as a means of measuring and sustaining civic health and it's all related and you can definitely find more information about those relationships on our website here. Yes, and hopefully um, you you really can't, can you see me okay and, and hear me okay because I might go off of camera. This is really it's doing something very funny to me. All right, I am going to show you um, the website very quickly. And then, and what I would like to do is to ask all of you to start jumping in with questions because um, this is your hour and we wanna answer any question that we can for you. But the first thing we wanted to show you is that we have created this resource for you um, and to make voting and voter registration and voter engagement easy. And Deanna's on here, and hopefully we will be adding um, information about um, Social Work Helper as well. But so this main page, you can get a lot of things. You can check your voter registration, you can register to vote, 
you get information about special populations. This is particularly important for social workers. So if you're working with folks who are experiencing homelessness or um, newly, um, you know, newly housing insecure, that this gives you information. There are all these links. Um, folks living in residential care, people working in the military or, or posted overseas, if you are a non-English speaker, survivors of, of violence, there are, there are processes. So for example, with survivors of domestic violence or any, um, any um, sexual assault, there are systems in all 50 states to keep your address confidential. So we've got these resources here and we always ask that you, uh, that you send us more if you need them. Mm -hmm. We've got your voting rights here. So everyone should know what their voting rights are before they go to the polls. Uh, we've got that here. Um, you can order your absentee ballot. You can find your polling place. And then for those of you who are in schools of social work, you might want to start running some voter registration drives or doing this work. So all the things that we've, we've shown you here, um, we have slides. They're not the exact slides for today, but I will absolutely send all those, these to um, here. But they're very similar here and a recording. We've got um, voter activities that I sent to you in the chat. We've got ideas, um, sample assignments for you to bring. And we've got um, uh, nonpartisan resources. So there's also a fact sheet that you can share with your field supervisor on social work's call to action and turn out the vote, why voting matters, barriers to voting, and ways that you can make a difference. Right. And, and I just while it's on my mind really quick, I want to jump in and just say another thing that you can do before election day is you can call up your registrar voters and just ask what kind of uh, equipment they have for people who may have specialized needs. Uh, do they have the space? Everyone legally has to. Uh, I know in Connecticut, they absolutely have. If you're hard of hearing or if you're hard of seeing, there's special regulations and just to make sure that they're compliant or and just to inquire and just stay involved to make sure that people have what they need when they arrive. That's right. All of you will start to now, I, I, I believe that all of you are democracy warriors and all of you will start to see this system of voting through a different lens going forward. You know, when you show up to the polls, what would somebody do um, if they couldn't, if they had trouble walking or if they didn't speak the language? they don't offer the, the um, accommodations for non-English speakers all are only in place if more than 5% of the population speaks that particular language. So um, voting can be really challenging for people who don't speak English. So um, understanding, um, making a plan with clients and, and supporting people to vote is, is really important. And as you go through this, you will start to see and ask questions of each other. Does one community stand in line longer? Um, is one community um, have more polling places or more convenient polling places? What are the hours? You know, again, go through it as a system, um, your understanding of systems and apply that. Um, so here's a page for students that we have. We've got um, articles and resources that you might want to check out. Some of them are, um, some of them are academic journal articles, which I, I, I find the students don't find always um, a big draw, but there are movies in here that are really um, terrific, including the one rigged that we mentioned earlier. And you can watch that movie for free right online. Um, and other ways for you to get involved and share your story. So we've got the census. Again, it's six days less left. If you could do nothing but just text this message out to your friends and people that you know, there has never been more dis distrust in government. And that census, as Melissa said, will determine not only billions in funding, it's estimated that for every person missed in the census, it costs that state um, 20 to $40,000 per person over the next decade. So the loss of funding is significant to the agencies and the communities that we serve. The um, lack of political power will be critical because when one community turns out, again, like voting, when one community turns out relative to another, they get more political power, even written into the way that we um, write districts and, and create voting districts. So 
So that's the, um, that is the quick tour of the website. I hope that you will all check it out. I hope it will be a valuable tool. We do have upcoming events here. There are some very good things that you can do. One, Social Work Votes out of Columbia University is doing some great phone banking. Um, we've also got some other ways that you can get involved. The Southern Poverty Law Center is doing phone banking. There are many organizations that are doing nonpartisan work. And then there are also organizations doing partisan work, which we do not list here, but we do um, know that some of you will get involved that way. But the bottom line is mm. get involved and let us know if there's something that you would like to see up here. Um, Jenny, you will need to re-register with a name change after you get married. It depends. I mean, some people have two IDs. If your ID um, and your residence matches your registration, that's what's important is that your ID matches your registration. So I would highly encourage you to re-register. And remember, everybody mm -hmm. has to re-register after an address change. What other questions? And I, let me stop sharing my screen so that we can um, have a chat. I know we've got about five minutes left. <laughs> One of the things that comes up, and um, again, I hope that we will, we will get some questions. One of the things that comes up a lot is how to have difficult conversations. Um, we started at the Yukon um, School of Social Work a Hartford, Yukon Hartford Voting Power core. And it's a, it's a group of students. And um, I believe Zainab is involved. I don't know if she's still on this call. Oh, Zainab. Uh, Zainab, are you, are you involved in the Power Corps? I am, yes. Do you want to say a couple words about it? Uh, sure. <laughs> um, so I recently joined. I think it's been about two weeks. So we have like a roundtable meeting uh, weekly. Uh, last Friday, we had a kickoff meeting. Um, which was really informative. There was a lot of different speakers that talked about voting, um, the history behind it. Um, so it's been super helpful. It's been a great meeting um, people that have similar interests um, that are doing their MSW. Um, and um, I'm really excited to learn more about what I can do in my community because I actually live here in uh, Denver, Colorado. Um, but everything that we're learning still applies. It's just that, you know, I have to do some research on uh, Colorado laws and rules around registering to vote. Um, and so, um, so far I've been really enjoying getting to know everybody and learning. <laughs> well, it's great. And Colorado, we should say, is one of the five states that does all mail-in voting. Um, and their, their turnout is, is um, higher than in states that don't offer all, that, that don't offer mail-in mm -hmm. um, mail voting. So um, great. I love the status of the absentee ballot. Does somebody want to speak a little bit about what students are? Are you all, if you're a New Jersey student, you're obviously getting a ballot. Um, but I would imagine that those of you who live out of state but are attending school in New Jersey um, are not getting ballots, in which case you would have to either um, register in New Jersey if you want to vote in New Jersey, or you would have to vote by absentee ballot from your home. Jenny? Mm. Um, this doesn't, to the, this is more related to the 2016 election because in, during the 2016 election, my legal address was in New Jersey, but I was in college in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So with that one, we didn't have ballots. We had, um, different locations where you could vote at, but the thing that I felt was strange with the way my college in particular had done it was based on your last name or different things. Some people voted right on campus. They could just go to a building on campus. Other people had to walk, like I had to walk like a 20 minute distance to go to a church to vote. And I think that could have prevented some people from voting because they had to walk around an area that they weren't really familiar with and go somewhere to vote. And usually you, there were groups, but if you didn't know anybody, you walk, I walked alone, which is not ideal. No, and you're, you're, you're not alone. This came up yesterday in our CSWE training, um, saying that some schools will split the campus into different um, 
voting locations like the, the one that you're mentioning. And, and what we know is that this is determined on the local level and, and that in, in many communities, they have cut down significantly the number of polling places. And that, that is by design um, oftentimes. So again, you know, we don't make it easy. And I appreciate you sharing that. Um, any other questions? Oh, come on, there must be one. Yeah, please feel free to put any questions in the chat or if you're on yeah. Facebook, uh, comment it on the video so that I can definitely see it and answer that. Um, but I do wanna be mindful of everybody's time. So if you have any last minute questions, shoot them in now. But if not, uh, thank you so much, Tanya and Melissa for this really informative presentation. You gave a lot of really great resources. And I think a lot of people are very interested in getting a copy of your slides. So if you wanna send those to me or I can send you the emails of everybody who wants the slides whatever's easiest. I would love um, I, I would love it if we could include you on our mailing list for voting as social work. And if you want to get involved, you can sign right up um, on our link and, and we'll do both. We'll, we'll send the si slides to you, Annie. And then if you um, can send us folks email address, that would be great because we'd love to include you on our future correspondence with it, whether it's the campaign school or any other kind of voting um, announcement. We'll be doing another session um, in New Jersey with NASW in a couple of weeks. So, well, I thank you for inviting us, Annie, today. Melissa, thanks for presenting with me. And um, nice to be with all of you. And, you know, we've, we've, we've got a really important election. I hope all of you will leave today with some action steps, including um, six, the next six days over the census, registering voters in every chat room, in every classroom, send out those links. Don't miss an opportunity to encourage somebody to vote. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. And uh, stay tuned for our other Road to November events. Tomorrow we have an event on uh, Beyond RBG, her legacy and what's next for the Supreme Court. On Monday, we have a webinar about navigating difficult conversations in difficult times. And, you know, as Tanya had said we have another voter mobilization webinar scheduled for October, so we'd love to see you guys there as well. So thank you so much um, and stay tuned for the rest of our content. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.